put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. Thief 2 Video Game Review After the events of the first game, which I'm going to try not to spoil in this video, Garrett is now facing the Metal Age. He is still in the city, which allows us and him to see the changes that the Metal Age have made. Nature is in rapid retreat with industrialism and all that it begets taking over more and more. Trees are replaced with chimneys, to quote one of the NPCs. The pagans are also much more... they're, they're pretty much on the run. They have very little power left. The balance of power is now shifted entirely in the in favor of the the, the religious in, institution. And the the not the order of the hammer, but the the mechanists, rather, an offshoot of the Order of the Hammer, and I'll get into the differences between them. Garrett is pretty much going about his business as usual, it doesn't matter too much to him what the city looks like, but the, the new sheriff has been very aggressive in taking out crime. He has been, he's taken out a lot of fences and he's basically hired criminals to, yeah, help do police work, guarding and the like. And it's, he doesn't seem entirely trustworthy, the, the Sheriff Truard. And with that, the, the city from a the has, has basically morphed from a theocracy into a police state. To, to quote another NPC, before you, you know, things were bad under the hammers, but now you could get, you know, done in for having seen something you shouldn't have. And, of course, with this increase in police power, sooner or later, it got to Garrett as well. Early on, he is attacked, and it does not seem like they were that preoccupied with keeping him alive, with just taking him in to put in prison. He can't shake the feeling that it was maybe a hit, so he starts to investigate, and over the course of the game, he unravels a conspiracy that involves a lot of different groups in the city. Given that this is very similar to the first, I'm going to try to not spend too much time basically repeating what I said for the first, but I will still be saying it because it is well worth noting, but yes, it's a good place to start is to, to quote another reviewer that this is essentially an add-on to uh, the first, with, with the big difference between this and an add-on being that this has a story, and a good one, and it's actually as long, possibly even longer, actually, yeah, I believe this is longer than the first one. 
Now, the... Yes, to, to, to get into some of the basic game mechanics. This is still based on the Dark Engine, an upgraded Dark Engine, however, and I really can't fault them for that because the Dark Engine is awesome. Having created these three amazing games, Thief 1, Thief 2, and System Shock 2. Now, the, the, the gist of the gameplay is that you have to sneak between shadows and also watch how much noise you're making. This is done by the, the shadow, you, can, you have a light meter that always tells you if you're in light or in shadow, which is very useful because sometimes areas that you really would have thought were in shadow, you, re you look at them and you're like, this is shadow, once you enter them, you find out they're not actually quite dark enough to, to yeah, sometimes very much brighter than, but yeah, and as far as n the noise you make, this is usually related to what surface you're walking on and how fast you're walking and you have the typical you know you can you can run you can jump jumping obviously makes the loudest amount of noise the moment you land on something that makes the loudest noise you can you know crouch down and then you have a you know it's it's called creep in this it's essentially your walking command in in you actually I think there's also walk, but yeah, to walk especially slowly. So obviously the slowest and most silent way to move is to crouch down and use creep, but yeah, it'll also be the slowest. And once you enter light, it doesn't matter that you're being silent. If someone sees you in light, they're going to know you're there. And it's also worth noting that making noise only makes guards investigate if they don't walk directly into you or see you, they're not actually going to know exactly where you are. And they will eventually stop investigating, depending on how loud the noise was and if they hear more than one noise. If you, whilst trying to get away from them, make more noise, then obviously they're going to further investigate. And everything, you know, if you weren't seen in like just broad, not broad daylight, because you're, every mission takes place during the night, of course. <sighs> yeah, if, if you're seen in just bright light and up close, then they just know you're there. But if, if not quite that, even if you're just, if there are like several meters between you and the person seeing you, you could be in bright light without them immediately knowing you're there. That gives you a grace period to get away. And this goes for everything that might spot you. Now, you have some tools at your disposal. You have weaponry, although... For the first game, the, the developers made the comparison that you are like a submarine. You are very powerful when hidden, but vulnerable when exposed. And this is very true. You basically, you can fight, but you are a thief. You are wearing light clothing, and you're not trained to fight. Everyone you're up against that, you know, actually fights back. There, there are guards and servants, and servants will just call for help. But any guard you encounter, they're there to fight. They're there to fight off people that, you know, not, not necessarily just thieves. This is, you know, this is set in a steampunk world. So we're talking, you know, there's electricity and, you know, modern devices, but it's also kind of medieval in nature. So, yeah, they might have to fight off you know, not necessarily an army, but a, a small group of, like, mercenaries, let's say. So, yeah, there are, there are a lot of them, they all know how to fight, they're armored, and they, they will call for backup if they need it. Actually, if you wound someone but don't quite kill them, 
the, the guy's going to run off and try to call for backup, so you really want to not let that happen if you do start fighting them. So, yeah, you're, the, the less you fight, the, the easier of a time you'll have with the game. And really, how much or how little violence is very dependent on skill. You can go for absolutely no violence, you can just sneak past, you can knock them out, or you can try to take out everyone. It, it depends on your skill, and the game is very non-linear in the way you approach it. Level design, and just in general, how you choose to solve the different obstacles in your way. So, the, the, the weapons are mainly a, a sort of last resort, and some of them can also be used for distraction, creating further options for, for stealth. You have a moss arrow, which basically creates moss in the general area where you fired it, that you can run across with no sound. Actually, to, to further flesh that aspect out, the, the surface you're on makes a certain amount of noise depending on what type of surface it is, regardless of, you know, even walking slowly, marble is going to make a lot of noise. Stone, less so. Wood, not too much. And once we're talking carpet, there's little, you can run, you can jump, go nuts. You, you'll never make noise on that. But yeah, the, the moss arrow is thus quite useful for you know, allowing sneaking like that. You have a water arrow, which can turn, you know, it can douse the flames of any torch. But you will have, you will note that not every light source in this game is a torch. There are a number of electrical lights and other such. And the mechanists have created a new light source. I think it's like oil-based or something. You can turn that off with a water arrow, but they can turn it right back on. If you create, if you turn off too many of those, you know, they're, they're gonna walk through the darkness and complain, and they might just go ahead and turn it back on. And, yeah, you'd have to use another water arrow to turn it back off, and again, they might just turn it right back on. So, plan. Don't, don't turn, out, turn out every single one of those. And you have a, an arrow that creates, you know, a noisemaker arrow, which makes a certain amount of noise and, yeah, distracts guards in a certain area. And that, that's as much um, of, of the weaponry as I'm going to go into to, to leave some surprises for you to... Well, I do have to mention the... the wonderful rope arrows, which literally attach to any wooden surface and, you know, lets out a, a rope, which it has a certain overall length, I think it's like 10 meters total, excuse me, if, if there isn't that far down, then it won't be as long, but yeah, you can, you can use that to get further up. In fact, I counted 11... A good... Most of the levels do have the opportunity for you to quite simply use a rope arrow to get above your target, to sneak around over the, yeah, the, the guards and such, which I believe is, is a bit more than, than the first. In general, this is much more non-linear than the first. I'll get into that more. Now, I suppose, yeah, the, the items, of course. You have some potions that are quite useful for the sneaking around. A, a speed potion, which yeah, it, it allows you to run faster and thus make further jumps. 
whenever you jump, if you don't quite make it on top of something, you can mantle over it just by holding down the jump button, much like in System Shock 2 and Thief 1, as long as it's a surface which you can climb. Obviously, if it's like, you know, if it goes up into a, um, yeah, let's say you're coming from here and it goes up like this, you can't climb up if you only hit here. But if it's a flat surface, you can climb on the mantle yourself over it. Now, the this introduces the invisibility potion, which it's, it's of limited time, it's fairly rare, expensive, and it does not make you inaudible, but it rocks! It is just unbelievably useful, and yeah, I, I, it's amazing, and an amazing tool in, in this game, and you also get a slowfall potion, which allows you to survive further jumps, and, or, or drops rather, and not take damage from drops that would otherwise take damage, and this combined with rope arrows literally allow you to just drop right down to, yeah, and I, I, I will also go into the, the there, there are lock picks in this game. There's base, there, there are two lock picks, a square tooth and a triangle tooth. And sometimes you'll have to use both, sometimes it's just the one. Depends on how complex the lock is. And, and obviously it's not all, every lock that can be picked like that, but a lot of them can. And the one of the goals with these two games that the developer stated was you you should be able to just sit down and play the game. So it's at its surface it can seem very simple and some of the you know it's it's easy to use. It's a very friendly interface you might say. It's it's very much just yeah, you know, if you've ever played a first-person shooter, you can just sit down and play one of these two games. No problem. The, you know, unlike System Shock 2, it does not, it doesn't have a sort of, you know, there, there's no micromanaging, there's no, you know, your inventory is not limited and it's, yeah, it, and, and there aren't role-playing game aspects in the, you know, you have a lot of different equipment, but you can't upgrade anything. There is no, you know, so, yeah, you can sit right down and play it. Thus, the lockpicks are just holding down the use key. And the, the way that it's still challenging is that you might actually be very close to someone else when you're picking a lock, and lockpicking isn't silent. So, you, you want to be very careful that you don't make too much noise that they just straight up hear you and turn in your direction and there you are, you know, trying to pick a lock open. Not that many doors are in shadow, you'll, you'll note, you know, probably not for your benefit as much as just, you know, seeing where you're going when you enter a door. So, yeah, and, and this can take anywhere between just a second or two for the really simple locks to, I'd say, a good five or ten seconds, having to also switch back and forth between the lock picks, and you know, being very aware of your surroundings. And you can, you know, this is not like more modern lock picking mechanisms where you have to do it, you know, from start to finish. If you if you disengage at some point, you have to start over. In this. Once you've started picking a lock, you know, if you stop part of the way through, you can just go right back and continue from that point. And you have a very useful visual indication in that the, the door handle, which you, you can see if you look at the door handle, that's actually where the, the keyhole is. So when you're picking a lock, literally the, the door handle will move as if you are opening it 
and you can tell, you know, it, it starts, you know, the horizontal, once it's entirely vertical, you've unlocked it completely. So you can very much tell. And you can also see, you can also hear, you know, if, if, the, if the noise of, of picking lock stops, you have to switch to another pick. If it never actually starts, then it means that either you've got the wrong lock pick, or, you know, you're going to need a key, or, you know, you might not be able to use the... You might not be able to open this door at all at this point. Now, I suppose that pretty well covers your your tools. So yes, you, you have a you have a lot of tools at your disposal and it's very much up to yourself how you use them. And that's where the game is as part of how the game is very open. You you know yeah, you, you very much choose yourself when and to what exact end you're going to use these. It is worth using everything you have in a level because it does not carry over and neither does your loot. Any Anything you steal in, let's say, level 1 is to be used to buy equipment for level 2. Once you get to level 3, none of the loot that you had is still there. The loot you have for level 3 was the one, the, the stuff you stole in level 2. And loot is not only obvious money stuff, it can also just be items like a, a fancy vase or, you know... At one point I found like golden spectacles, you know, like, like glasses. Those are worth money, so yeah. And the... Yes, the... You, you, you have a map of the, the area you're in, although as you go, these get increasingly less detailed, decreasingly detailed, and, you know, you might have to fill in some of it yourself. So, the, the you know, the, the finest cartographers in the land would very much appreciate it. Now, you will revisit some areas, and this enables you to see, you know, the, the change that has occurred since you last visited that area, and, yeah, the things like that. Now, the, the map has a, a new feature, the, basically, you know, in, in both this and the first, you have a map and you have a compass and that's it, you know, and besides your compass, you can only ever show one thing in your inventory at a time. Your compass is part of your inventory, so if you've got the lock picks out, you can't have the compass out. And you don't have any real indication of, you know, how far away is something. You just have the map and you can follow. Yeah, so you very much have to find out how far away things are, and the longer you spend in, you know, in a level, I mean, as you go, you can, you can check out your map, or you can just see different, you know, openings, and you will have to choose your path. And then as you explore the level, you'll be able to find shortcuts between the different areas and paths, and yeah, it's it's very much, you know, the the longer you spend in a level and the more you explore this level, the better a grip of where does this and that path go will you have. But obviously, the more you explore, the more risk you you know, expose yourself to. And at the same time, the more loot you might encounter, the more clues about the situation and the you know, the, the storytelling, Garrett has a very narrow perspective. He's kind of, he is just the thief. He, he does not want to, he doesn't care about what goes on unless it affects him. The, the reason he's involved in this plot is because he is targeted. 
you know, so he wants to stop whoever's trying to kill him so he can go about his business. That's basically it. And thus, he did, you know, he, and he certainly isn't an audience proxy, nor would he ever take the time to explain things. Like, he'll, he'll briefly, you know, think about what, what is the situation here. Like, so Garrett will go over, you know, well, I need rent, and a lot of places are no longer possible for me to rob. This is like the second level of something that, you know, briefing them, quoting from, don't worry. I guess I'll go to this place to rob. And that's, that's about it. Otherwise, the storytelling and world building is very much in the text you read. Some, you know, most level briefings will have a short quote from one of the various factions. And, yeah, that's, that's very much, you know, yeah, how you learn what is going on. And you as the player can piece together what is actually going on beyond G Garrett's perspective. He is not that active in the overall plot. A lot happens without him there, in part because he is the thief. If, if he learns something directly, it's probably because he you know, what's it called, he, he spied in on someone, or the like. And that is something you will be asked to do, spy on someone, you know, maybe follow someone secretively. Now, yes, to get briefly more into the factions, the, the pagans that I mentioned earlier are worshippers of nature, and they, yeah, they've, they've lost a lot of power, and, and the, the nature that they worship basically represents, you know, chaos and letting things happen, you might say, and, you know, the, the yeah, very much opposed to technology and modern society, because it is not natural. It's something that we humans have created beyond what, yeah. And, you know, pagans also, yeah, there, there are some creatures there that, I should, I should briefly mention, there are some intensely, a, f a few intensely disgusting and disturbing sights in this. There, I, I won't give details, but let's just say there were times when I approached something, something natural, and suddenly it just, yeah, let's, let's just say I saw something and I was like, that's not what I think it is, is it? Because it's, it's standing perfectly, st no, it's not alive. Of course it's not alive, it's just part of this general area, and so I, I approached it to, to satisfy my curiosity, to confirm what I already knew, because of course it wasn't alive, and the moment I got within reach of it, it came alive, and it was just terrifying, and yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, nightmare fodder right there, so, so that's very, and that's the pagans, you know, they, Something might be hidden in the dark to terrify you, but it it came out of nature. It's something that yeah, and in fact, you might say that there are some very aggressive parts of nature now because the you know all of this decrease of nature. You know, it's very much lost a lot of power. So obviously, some very aggressive parts of nature will now show up. And then you have the, before I get into the mechanists, the keepers who fight to keep the balance between the pagans, and before it was the Hammerites, now it's the mechanists. The keepers 
don't directly interfere, they just make sure that some things are in the right place at the right time, just to make sure that everything goes the way it should. But they, they know a whole lot about what's going on, and they, yeah, they fight to make sure that what is supposed to happen does happen. To, to go into the Hammerites, before I get into the Mechanists, the Hammerites are this very disciplined and, you know, if, I think I will go into the, the two different symbols of the Hammerites and the Mechanists. To briefly, the, the overview is that both of them are all about progress, industrialism, mechanical creation, you know, building things to make things better. And the, yeah, I suppose that, that pretty well covers it. The mechanists are the offshoot that are now the, the main faction of, you know, they're an offshoot of the Hammerites and they have much more control now than the Hammerites do now. In the first game, the Hammerites were basically the people in charge. They ran the prisons and, yeah, it was very much, like I said earlier, it was a theocracy and the Hammerites were the, the leaders. And it's, it's very much this kind of, yeah, the, the two symbols, the, the Hammerites have the hammer and the Mechanists have the gear. And the Hammerites are all about discipline and the, you know, discipline in order to deserve the afterlife. The hammer is a very punitive symbol. It is about crafting simple things by hand. You know, you're... Yeah, you're, you're building a house out of wood and you use the hammer to, you know, with the nails to, yeah, secure it. It's, it's more simple because they always had to fight off the pagans. With the pagans having lost a lot of ground, the Hammerites still wanted to hold on to the, the discipline. That was still their beliefs. Now, both the Hammerites and the Mechanists are devoted to the builder, a yeah, a, a a deity of progress, of building things out of metal and the like, and the the gear of the mechanist very much represents that you build the afterlife right here, you you know, and and or rather, the Mechanists want to build the afterlife here because they feel that they can. I mean, the, the Pagans are all but gone, so what would be stopping them at this point? And the gear is very much the... this kind of, you know, wor working together. You have more advanced technology, you know, the hammer compared to the gear, very yeah, and the gear is also part of a whole, and again, we have industrialism, and, and I should mention, the, the hammer, of course, also represents terrific bang. I know, I know, I didn't think they had it in them either. The mechanists bring about more advanced, you know, constructions of metal. There are robots and security cameras and such sentry guns now the before I get too much into it I do want to point out it is slightly unfortunate that one of the things that they focused on with as, as projectiles of these you know guard robots 
thoughts and centuries is a bomb. And I'm not even talking like something that really looks interesting. I'm talking about old fashioned. It's not quite, you know, the, the, the you know, roles of TNT or, you know, but it is the old fashioned, you know, cartoon black and white movie round lit fuse bomb and usually what will happen is they'll hit you directly and then bounce off and they'll do damage as they hit you it is metal and it's being shot at you fast and then it explodes and the explosion isn't very big and it's usually very easy to get away from I feel like they should have nixed that they they should have you know seen in in testing that okay this looks goofy let's get rid of it and just yeah gotten rid of it because it is just it is kind of goofy if if maybe the bomb looked different and it exploded the moment it was fired at you i realized that that would have made the game a lot harder but otherwise they should have gone with something else and you know fortunately they do sometimes go with other things the you know, as I've already insinuated, you have a bow and arrow. You can also fire regular arrows. The some of the sentries will also fire arrows, and some of them will fire little metal discs, like little saw blades. You know, like three of those at at once. That's really cool. That's very scary and and intense. And yeah, I wish that they had done that with, with all of them, but yes, usually a sentry will be combined with a camera, not every camera means a sentry, but a sentry usually means a camera, because the sentries can't really find you if you haven't already been discovered. Now some of the sentries are, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but let's just say you will have to watch your step around sentries that don't have cameras around them, lest you might accidentally trigger the, the sentry. But otherwise, if the camera spots you, and it's your, it's your straight, you know, regular deal. If you haven't been seen at all, the camera lights green. If you have been seen, but it's just, you know, you're getting that grace period that I mentioned earlier, yellow. Once you've been spotted and the alarm goes, it's red. Now, an alarm in this game doesn't mean the same as, say, an alarm in Deus Ex 1. It, you know, or, or System Shock 2, for example. It doesn't mean that, like, immediately, you know, others will zero in on your position. It might, but not necessarily. It depends on the level and what is going on overall and, and such. Now, the... Yeah, the, the sentries and the camera cameras make up one of the only uses I've found thus far for the fire arrow. This was also present in the first game. I don't remember using much of it. I mean, you'd think with a fire arrow, it literally explodes on impact. You'd think that was like, okay, I fire this at a guy, obviously he's dead. Well, no. It, I figure it does more damage than a regular arrow, but a regular arrow to the head kills instantly. So the fire arrow, yeah, and it flies slowly, slower than a regular arrow. So it's kind of it's kind of like a rocket, and if they move just a little bit, they might step out of its way. But here, a single one will destroy a sentry or a camera, both if they're very close, which they often are. And of course, again, you have a limited amount of these, and you could use the grace period of the camera to get past the camera. So maybe you'll want to save that arrow, but maybe not. Yeah. And there usually is more than one way into, you know, to, towards the where you have to go. Now, the, the robots themselves, there are basically two sizes. I'm going to call the, the smaller one the sir. No, I won't. I'll call the small one the unarmed one, because they're also... Never mind. The, the smaller, the unarmed robot, they, they both look the same, it's just size-wise. And the unarmed one, yes, is unarmed, and will try to get a, an armed one. It's, it's 
it's very cute actually. It looks like a, a you know, seven-year-old getting its bigger brother or something. And yeah, the, the bigger ones, they come with the a gun for the for the bomb that I mentioned earlier, and they are tenacious. They are not gonna give up once they you know if they find you, I mean you can outrun them, but yeah shooting bombs, they're gonna keep firing at you, and if there's more than one in an area, <laughs> yeah. Now, the thing with the robots is that they are steam-powered, which means that they have a furnace at the back of them, and it has an, an opening, you know, presumably to let out the rest of the, you know, the, the air, yeah, you know what a furnace like. Think, think old-fashioned locomotive, you know. You've, you've got the thing where it, it goes out, so, yeah. Those are open, and if you manage to fire one arrow for the unarmed one, or two arrows for the bigger one, in there, that disables them permanently. And, and the first arrow for the bigger one will stun it for a few seconds, which, you know, those few seconds you can then use to fire the second one. But again, if they move, you might, you know, miss, because it is, it's not a huge area of their back that, and if you don't get any water into the furnace, then nothing will actually happen. And again, it's on the back of them, so if they've discovered you, that's, that's kind of it, you can't get behind them. I believe you can use fire arrows for, for them as well, though. So, so yeah, again, very much try to avoid, try to avoid getting spotted is, is the, the, you know, that's, that's more or less the one thing that this game, you know, try to avoid getting spotted and make sure to actually accomplish your objectives. Don't fail at any of them, other than that, you know, the world of this game is your oyster. You can just go anywhere and do anything, pretty much. The, the game has a realistic physics engine. Not entirely realistic, but still quite impressive. I, I think this is like the first game with, you know, or rather Thief 1 is the first game to have a realistic physics engine. And yes, any, any fire you see you can put out, even if it doesn't help you any. You can pick up pretty much anything that you should be able to pick up you know, boxes, you know, kitchen knives, you can't use these to fight, you can just toss them or put them back down, but it's there, you can do it. Now, the... I suppose that, more or less, yeah, to... I've, as, as for the, the robots and the cameras, you can also briefly stun their view with the the flash bomb, which is basically a flash bang, which, you know, that was also there in the first game, and you might otherwise use it on just regular guards, which will enable you to very quickly take them out, even from, to, to knock them out, even from the front, where otherwise you'd have to get behind them to knock them out, which obviously limits how many you can do and how easily you can knock them out. And, yeah, these will also, you know, you can think of it as, you know, also a grace period, but a grace period on your terms, almost. But do note that if they see you after the flash bomb, they, you know, they've realized that they were just flash bombed, so they're going to target you immediately, even if, you know, they barely saw you before, or didn't even see you before. Now. The both robots have the voice of Father Karras, the basically the, the leader of the entire mechanist church. And yeah, that is some ego to, to give every single one of them his voice. And this can sometimes mean that you can't tell from overhearing their voice, you know, the Using sound to tell where someone is, it's not only something your enemies can do, excuse me, it's something you can do as well. 
if you, you know, human guards will cough or clear their throat if they, you know, just if, if you're near them and, and sound travels realistically and then they'll say, did I see something or, or the like, if they start to spot you and they'll yell, you know, stop right there, if they do straight up see you. If you hear Father Karras' voice, you don't know which robot it is, but this is actually kind of cool because you'll then have to go in for a closer look and or you'll have to wait until it's close enough that you can hear the footsteps. And hearing the footsteps of these giant robots, well, giant, they're, they're the size of a human and slightly bigger. I believe it's the same model they use for System Shock 2. But keep in mind, in System Shock 2 you have a number of things you can do against them and depending on what, yeah, not here. If you, if you get behind them, two water arrows. Otherwise, maybe fire arrow. That's about it, and yeah, they can they can take you out like nothing, and there are no you know you don't get to just you know come back to life at at a rejuvenation station in this game. You you might have to start over if you haven't saved. So yeah, now that yes, so. Yeah, so they, they have a lot of the same movements as the System Shock 2 robot, and yeah, you can hear them moving from, you know, because of these these giant feet that they have. And, and note that they can move fairly fast once they know you're there. Now, every, every robot and camera has the really creepy face of, of, I believe it's Helios. Yeah, bring up Google. Cut in, in marble. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not some, you know... I was gonna say I'm not pretentious, but I really am, but it's not that I know a ton about Greek, you know, ancient Greece. It's, I, I looked it up to, to compare, but, but yeah, this, this immobile face with, with the one green eye that represents their, their one camera lens and the, the raspy voice, raspy light voice of Father Karras. And they, they will also say things very praising of Father Karras, like, when I was very young, Father Karras took me from the foundry and you know, yeah, things like that. Now, that actually brings me nicely into that, actually, briefly, I, there's some more to mention as far as items go. Because of something that happened first, Garrett has a mechanical eye. Obviously, you know, because of hammerites slash mechanists. This mechanical eye allows him to zoom at any point. The, the only thing, the only time you can't zoom with it is when you have the bow and arrow out. And that's because if you get the, the arrow, you know, once you've tightened it entirely, and you can, you know, it's not, you know, you bring it up and then you immediately fire. No, you have to hold it down while he stretches the bow. And after a little while of that, it'll slowly zoom in. That zoom is equivalent to the, you know, the mechanical eye zoom, so obviously you can't use both at the same time. And note also, after you hold it for several seconds at the highest level, he'll start, you know, the, the muscles will start to, to hurt from it, and he can't hold it quite steady anymore, and eventually he'll just have to, you know, un... I don't know what it's called, I'm not an archer. And, yeah, he'll, he'll just have to bring it down, and you'll have to start over with the, the aiming. So, th yes, you can more or less snipe in this game, although you also have to take into account that, you know, many of your errors arc in flight, and they don't, they don't hit immediately, you know, they, they do fly across the... And, yeah, like I said, you can't just all the time be having it ready to... Snipe, you, yeah. So anyway, that's one thing, and 
it's really awesome. At first, I thought, you know, you might worry a little that it makes it too easy, but it's really just that you no longer have to walk very close to see something. It allows you to easier see the, you know, what is far away, like an enemy patrolling. And yeah, it's, it's very, very useful. And another item you have is, and this is because of your mechanical eye, the Scout Scouting Orb, which is basically a ball with a camera, and it'll, it'll bounce slightly when it hits something, and then come to a, a standstill, and then until you press a key, until you do something other than move the mouse, you have a 360 degree angle camera that is wherever the ball landed, and you, know, you can toss this over a wall, you can you know, be standing far above the enemies with you know, things blocking view, your view, throw the, the orb down by them, you know, leave it there as long as you, as long as Garrett doesn't get, you know, discovered while he's standing there, stand somewhere in the shadows, then throw the ball. You can be using this camera for a while and just studying patrol paths. And as also goes for arrows that, you know, some of the arrows, at least, if they didn't hit, sometimes even if they did hit and do what they were supposed to do, you can pick it up afterwards and reuse it. So you can be using, if you have one scouting orb, you can use it however many times you want in the level, as long as you don't throw it down somewhere you can't pick it up, and you make sure to pick it up. That's, yeah, wonderful. Earlier I meant to say something more about the map. In this one, you do... It does highlight the, the area that you're currently in on the map, and any area that you've visited will be sort of blued out, you know, it'll, it'll, yeah. So you can read from the map, where have I been, and where am I in the basic. At first, I thought that this was one of these things of, you know, the, the sequel to a stealth title will get easier, and, you know, they'll, they'll dumb it down for mass appeal. Not so here. This allows them, rather, to make the maps much more complex. If, if they didn't add that, the game would be way too hard, frankly. And, yeah, the maps are huge. They, you know, it can take you between an hour and a half and two and a half hours to do everything. And, I mean, I, I play fairly perfectionist, so it's not necessarily going to take you that long, but yeah, it's it's there for you to do if if you want, you know. And the... Yes, in fact, that brings me very nicely to the levels. For the first game, the the story was written first, and then the levels built to fit the story. In this one, it was done the other way around. They created the levels that they wanted to and retrofitted the story. I worry that this might impact the story negatively, but not so, and I'll get back to that. The levels, where the first one was very much, I'd say maybe half and half, these stealth levels and then these supernatural very linear supernatural levels with undead and magical enemies. This one, basically all stealth. Like, there's, you might say, I counted two levels that were linear, and one of them you could still explore in a non-linear fashion. And there's not a single level of this game that truly calls on you to not be stealthy. You can complete this entire game without breaking stealth mode, so, so to speak. You know, I mean, you may have to eventually take, you know, you can't necessarily have absolutely no blood on your hands, get absolutely no knockouts or the like, but you don't have to be noticed. You know, if you knock someone out and hide their body, and this is where shadows, again, come in quite handy, then, yeah, that, 
that's fine, that there's no, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Although some levels will call on you to limit how much, you know, how many you take out. Now, the, the basic level setup is, you know, infiltration, you know, stealth action of some sort, and then exfiltration. You will have to get back out afterwards. And you also have much more stealth to do. I, I don't know for sure, but maybe that was part of why there were so many non-stealth levels and so many linear levels in the first that they couldn't quite come up with enough stealth stuff to do. In this one, you don't only steal. You kidnap, you will... You're trying not to give too many away. Yeah, I already mentioned you, you might have to tail someone, frame someone. There, there are a number of things that you get to do that involve being stealthy. Now, the... Yeah, the, the levels are huge, and like the non-linear levels of the first, everything is basically connected. You know, like I said, you, you'll find shortcuts between areas, and I'd say to, to an extent, every level is its own little ecosystem. You can go everywhere, do everything. Let's say that you have, let's say you're infiltrating somewhere that has a barracks. That barracks might lead out into the garden because, you know, maybe, it, you know, once they've trained for a while, maybe they go back out into the garden, take a break. It might also lead towards the, the kitchen to make it easier to bring food to these guys. Maybe there'll be a locked door towards one of the, you know, more important areas so that the guards can very quickly reinforce that area. That's three different paths right there into this one area. And yeah, you can use them all as much or as little as you feel like. And again, the, the rope arrow thing, you might literally be, you know, up somewhere. And if you fire a rope arrow, you can get safely down and then you know, you can, you can leave it there and safely get back up later, if you'd like. Now, the, the levels tend to be the, the urban areas. You, you very much go around the city this time. And you'll go to a, you know, a police station. There's, you know, there are mansions. And you do get to go to the, the pagan woods some as well. Now, I know this is going to sound like I am impossible to please, but I do have to say that the world building does suffer some from the fact that it's almost all in, you know, the, the urban setting. Before I go any further, I will say I love both this game and the first one for slightly different reasons in some cases, but, you know, the gameplay is solid in both of them. The first one focused mostly on world building, and that's why it was, like I mentioned, you know, supernatural, you know, undead magical enemies. This doesn't mean, well, you'll go to a graveyard. Well, you'll go to a graveyard, maybe there's, you know, one of the first level levels is like this ancient, you know, tomb kind of thing. It's not a graveyard. It's it's something I'm not entirely certain what the correct term is, but yeah. And it really brings out that Garrett's world is not just the city. It is it is this big place and, and also says, you know, as a thief he might not get to just sneak around mansions and deal with, you know, these these dopey sounding guards. Yeah, that hasn't changed. He might have to go, you know, digging through, uh, you know, well, digging through. He might have to go explore an ancient tomb or, or the like. And at the same time, the first one did not have as much plot and it did not start as soon as this one. In this one, the plot starts almost immediately. I'm not going to give away exactly where it starts, but... Yeah, very early and keeps being developed throughout. There are, there are some twists and every development feels genuine and indeed it focuses on fleshing out characters involved in the plot and 
really highlighting, you know, what is this organization doing and what is this other organization doing. And yes, thus the world building is lesser, but that does also, you know, presumably you play the first one and then this one. Certainly this game in some ways expects you to play the first one. It's not gonna take great care to not spoil the first one. I, you know, it doesn't spell out everything that happened in the first, but, you know, there are, there are mentions, there are references. In fact, yeah, again, like I said, they expect you to have played the first one. If you haven't played the first one, there are lines in this. You might get them, but you're, you know, the moment that they reference something might be the first you've heard of something, and, you know, having to take in both plots at once might be a bit much, you know, you might, yeah, you will want to have played the first one, I'd say, but, yeah, because of that, making the first one focus on the world building, and then this one focus on the plot, because the world hasn't changed that much, the, we, we do get to see how the pagans are doing on, um, with, you know, the, the changes since the first, and other than that, we do have this, yeah, in the first, we have a number of, of areas. I mean, yeah, I mentioned the tomb and these undead. That hasn't really changed, because that didn't have anything to do with the pagans. That was something else. You know, there, there are more than the two factions in the world of Thief. It's just that the two most powerful ones are this religious order, you know, Hammerites slash Mechanists, and the order of nature the pagans, or order, they're not, the, the disorder of pagans, rather. And, yeah, so, so it, it works rather well to, yeah, the, the way they did this. And I swear, they must have planned this game when they made the first one, because there is so much that carries into it. The, the plot is brilliantly written. The, the, yeah, everyone's motivation, all the, the character stuff, and just this, you know, I've already gone into the, the, the balance between the, you know, or in this case, the balance having tipped in favor of the mechanists. And this is explore. The, neither of these two games ever say that progress is wrong, or that nature and chaos is wrong. There are positives and negatives to both, and the keepers pretty much have it right. The important thing is balance. We shouldn't completely just, you know, keep... We shouldn't move entirely away from nature, because that is, you know, we, we are part of nature. What we do to nature affects us as well, if for no other reason than that. And, and there's beauty in nature, you know, we can't make everything with our own two hands that, you know, that is beautiful and that is, yeah. And at the same time, nature is very volatile state of, of being. It's, it's very hard to form a society without going some against nature and, you know, shelter from harsh weather and helping those that might not be able to survive in just nature. So, yeah, good and bad to both. And where the first game very much showed, you know, both sides, sides equally strong, this one shows what happens when the pagans come very close to extinction, and how does that happen. And so, yeah, there's, there's very solid exploration of these themes. The, the main conflict is the same in both of these games, but the, the odds have changed dramatically. And though Garrett might not think it, it might end up affecting him, nonetheless. Now, the... I suppose that quite covers the level... This one does also have flares, another item that 
is well worth mentioning. In the first, there were several times where I honestly felt like maybe it would be good if the game gave you something to light your way, because there are some dark areas in these games. It, you know, like I said, everything takes place at night, and you won't necessarily get, you know, you, you are using shadow to hide, so it's not exactly like the, the, yeah, it's, you, you will go through areas that are extremely dark. And some areas will have light switches and the like, but you might not always want to turn on the entire light, and all the areas that don't, you have the flare. And the flare works very much in the way that we're used to flares working. First time you activate it, you know, Garrett brings it out, and I believe when he brings it out, you can't have the compass going again, so yeah, it's very much, you have two hands. You can have a weapon in one, you can have an item in the other, but you don't have three. You cannot use an item and then have another item ready. It doesn't work that way, you know. And I don't know, I guess he, he really can't use his left hand for the other item, but whatever. Those are the cards that the game deals us, and I'm very, very happy with that. So yeah, if you want to use a flare, you're going to have to not use the, the compass. Anyway, second press, he tosses it. And yeah, this is it's really, really useful. And I believe, again, yeah, you can pick it up. You can at least pick it up if, if you've thrown it or drop it. You can always drop an item that you're holding just, you know, down by, by your feet or the like. And, yeah, you can, you can pick it up and he'll again hold it. So, yeah. Now, the... I will have to mention there, there are some things that... that the first, that, that were problems in the first, and that are not the, are not addressed here. When you, you know, when you approach something, it'll light up when you can interact with it. And usually you'll be able to tell, you know, if it's a door, yeah, you can try to open it. But if it's an object, a world object, you won't always be able to tell. Will I pick it up as, you know, hold it in your, in both hands, at which point you can't do anything other than use it, or will I add it to my inventory? Is it something that I can use? Maybe it's goods. That's what money is called in this game, because some of the things you look at look like they might be goods, and yeah. Usually when you grab something that turns out to just, you know, you have to put it back down. If you put it down on a surface that isn't noisy, you can even, you know, you can crouch down, look to, you know, look at your, look down, and then press drop item, and it'll make almost no noise. But still, this is a problem, because you might pick something up thinking that, you know, if, if you're on the clock, and you are a lot, you spend a lot of this game on the clock, you know, you're like, okay, I have 10-15 seconds before the guard returns and sees me here, so I have to make sure to actually get all these, you know, all the goods in here. And if every other item you're trying to pick up turns out to be something you then have to drop, that's really irritating, and I, I would definitely say they, they could do some kind of, you know, I, I appreciate that everything lights up when you can, you know, interact with it, but maybe just have, like, a partial tint to the light when it's something you'd be picking up with your hands. That, that, would, that would solve it right there. The, an, another issue is that you get stuck in areas. That's actually gotten a lot worse. There's a level of this where there, there's some secret passage stuff going on. I got stuck so many different places, just entering or exiting the secret passage, moving through the secret passage. I eventually pretty much had to stay away from the secret passage entirely. And what makes this worse is you'll often simply have to load to get out of this. And, you know, part of the fun of this game is, I mean, you can, you can, 
save as many times as you want, load as many times as you want. The game's never going to penalize you for that. But part of the fun of this kind of game is, let's see how far I can make it without saving, you know. Some people are going to play through a level without actually saving, you know, other than if they have to take a break in, in playing the level or something, you know. So, so that's a huge problem there. And then we have the, the fact that you can't always be sure if, you, if letting go of a rope or a ladder is silent. You know, sometimes this will happen, like, if you're, if you're facing an area, if, yeah, if, if you're facing something you can mantle from the rope or ladder, sometimes this will work. But again, sometimes it won't. Sometimes you'll just jump off the ladder or rope. And that's, you might say, the, that's the downside to using jump and holding down jump. I think maybe if they had, like, if you right-click and hold on a surface you want to mantle, and then jump and hold it down. Either it says can't do that, or it actually mantles. Because too often in this, you'll try to mantle and it won't work. And yeah, when you try to disengage a rope or a ladder silently, obviously it's to not get spotted, because a number of these, yeah, yeah, I've, I've made my point. If it's not silent, you'll, you might get noticed. Now, the... Yeah, I suppose the... Yes, there is notable also that things have changed I, in, in the society. Like I mentioned, it goes from a theocracy to a police state. And with that, in the theocracy, you could basically depend on, you know, I mean, sure there might be some corrupt people, but basically what the Hamlers wanted is quite straightforward. They, they want to make sure that people work and that no one breaks the rules. It's all about the rules. There, there's this story about, you know, in, in the first one, you, you get into a, a prison, again, early level, not spoiling anything, and you can read what people were sentenced to and what their crime was. And literally, I mean, we are talking this kind of, you know, old, you know, medieval kind of punishment. Kind of, you know, if someone steals something, cut off their hand. I'm not sure that was one of them, but that's the basic idea. And there's this story about that, you know, from, from their, you know, holy book, that basically, you know, a priest was found to be having an affair, a sexual affair, with a woman, and they were both killed brutally, and that's it. So, so yeah, if, if the religious are being corrupt, then the other religious people will, you know, turn them in, and they'll be punished. So, you could basically depend on things. The, the rules might not be fair, again, you know, pros and cons, but the rules were there. They were set in stone. Here it's the sheriff who's quite the corruptible sort. He very much just wants power. There's this mention of the Baron is away, that, you know, once the Baron returns, Sheriff Truett won't have all this power. So, yeah, he, you know, he shouldn't be in power, but he is, and he's making the best of it, the most of it. So, yeah, you, you won't know for sure that things are, you know, and, and hence again, people are pining for the old Hammer days, because at least you knew what the rules were. You, you couldn't just get, you know, thrown in jail for no good reason. And that, of course, also brings up, why is it no longer a theocracy? Because nature has been in such, you know, the pagans were no longer a threat. So why should the hammers get to decide everything? The hammers kept people safe from the pagans, but now the pagans aren't a threat anymore. So they've lost a lot of power. And the mechanists aren't in power. They actually, they're, they're doing business. They are a legitimate business like the other businesses in the city. 
you can buy robots from them and you know presumably Garrett-esque mechanical eyes for replacement, you know, replacement limbs, presumably. So, yeah, and the and and there are also some hints that the the mechanists wish they had more power. Like there's this bit about that they act like they should be in charge to some people. Yeah. Now, the the. You know, both games are extremely immersive. The the sound and the level of detail to levels really place you right there. And dying in this game is much more impactful than dying in quite a few stealth games. And part of this is the first-person perspective and the horrifying scream, death scream from Garrett. And yeah, it's just the the world puts you right there. This is more focused than the first one again, you know, the, the plot versus the world building. Now the at times when when you're trying to listen to someone, you know, to a guard, if they've spotted you or something, there'll be there there might be fake outs. Someone might, you know, sneeze and at first it sounds like they're saying ah i found someone you know so yeah that's that's just mean man it's mean and the uh, yeah you have the you know obviously not mean enough that they deserved bankruptcy but you shouldn't go off on a rant about that the the Cameras have this buzzing, like like bees, that they they sound kind of what's it called? If if you know when they're just idle, when they haven't spotted you yet, they just sound like a flying bee, not not aggressive, just working. And that they'll you know they'll go around in usually almost a full circle, and. Why, yes, that does mean that there are blind spots. And if they spot you, there'll be this aggressive short buzz of, like, a bee that's about to attack. And yes, this game does have straight-up sirens. You know, you, you'll feel all nostalgic for guards just yelling, Hey, there's someone here, you know, yelling for <laughs> backup rather than these glaring sirens. I should maybe also note that when you overhear people talking, you can tell by what they say who they are. The pagans have horrible grammar. They're, they're violently uneducated, you know. I mean, rather than woods, they say woodsy, and yeah, they add IE to the end of a lot of words. Again, I'm not saying anything negative about the, the pagans. They I quite like the values of, you know, praising nature. And again, not just because it's keeping us alive. Uh, yeah, so basically, the, the you know, the, the regular guards will just, like I said, kind of, kind of dopey, Saturday morning cartoon, grouchy kind of voice, and they, you know, yeah, they might complain about, I've been here for three months, they can't push me around like this, or, you know, stuff like that. If, if they almost notice you, they might say, I've had too much coffee, you know, I should just, I should go with tea, they said I should, and, you know, the, the mechanists will speak in very religious sounding language, you know, didst I see something, uh, thou are, you know, such and such, yeah. Now, the I suppose that might more or less cover it. Yes, yeah, so the game took me four and a half hours to complete, and I didn't find every secret. And there, there are three difficulty settings, and the, the higher the difficulty settings, the more, 
the, the more objectives you'll have to complete. And the... I, I would also say this one, it has less puzzles. Like, you know, the first one, you know, other reviewers referred it to, refer to it as Tomb Raider, you know, portions, and I, you know, used that same term because that quite fits, so, yeah, puzzles, and this one didn't so much have puzzles, it's all about the sneaking. You, you know more or less where to go, you know more or less what you're supposed to do, you watch out for traps, and you try not to get noticed along the way. Now, I suppose that I should mention some of the movies that they watched in to, to get inspiration for this. And you can very much tell was The Third Man M, and Metropolis, and also Phantom of the Opera. I have not seen that one, so I can't say if they used, you know, how much they used that one, but yeah. You can definitely see, I mean, Metropolis, they've got this, this terrifying looking industrialism, these machines that just, you do not want to go near very much. I mean, yeah, and, and it again, it evokes, I mean, we know that when industrialism first happened, there was not that much regard for human workers. They, they died around those machines because they were not safe. And, you know, these, these machines could do the work of ten men. So, when, you know, it was not dealt with that, that they weren't that safe. It was just, oh, we'll get someone else. And that's very much the feeling you get here. Actually, uh, there is one more thing. There are a few graphics and audio glitches in this. It's, like I said, it is only a few. It's usually specific areas that, you know, there was one area where all the audio disappeared. Like, I couldn't hear any sound. The moment I went away from it, you know, it, it came back. And there were a few places where furniture was hovering in the air, like, you know, just, I don't know, 20 centimeters off the ground. And, you know, the exorcist assures me it's, it's you know, in-engine kind of, kind of issue. And yes, the, the graphics are still very much one of the weaker points, which, again, is why these games didn't make enough money. And, and, and yes, I appreciate even for the time. I mean, Half-Life, which is also from around this time, has better graphics, you know, overall. And, yeah. But I will say that mostly these two games do appreciate what they can do with graphics, and they try to just avoid doing things that they couldn't realistically render in part by videos usually using silhouette and yeah but this one does go a little bit away from that at points and show things that then don't completely look. It's, it's of course also in part because of the, the, the atmosphere which is phenomenal that it is this very dark world. I should also mention this game does not actually, you know, really have a... You're, you're not prevented from running or, or fighting, but you have to earn running and fighting. You know, it's, it's very much, depending on your skill, you'll be able to do a lot or very little in this game. But, regardless of your skill level, this will be challenging for you. Again, there's three difficulty settings, and if you intend to find every secret, avoid every enemy, you know, you can, you can give yourself challenges like that. Because the game is so open, you can replay it a lot and find new things, you know.
Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.